Kelly and Dr. Claire Robbins from my team at Duke. Uh, they will answer questions. Uh, Shaylin as well will answer questions if they're germane to Shaylin's uh, area of expertise. So our team will basically answer questions along the way uh, as we go through the webinar. And then some of the questions that you ask are the kinds of things that we'll save to where we have time to kind of talk more generally in a discussion about, about things. Um, so don't wait till the end to ask your questions, ask them along the way, and if they can be answered, we'll do it. And if not, we'll wait till the end. Uh, this being a, a focus on misophonia, we appreciate everyone doing their, their best to really try to provide a, an environment on the webinar that's supportive and conducive to, uh, to misophonia. Uh, we try to minimize uh, our own triggering on, on our end, and uh, we ask everybody to do the same as best as you possibly can. Um, okay, so I think with, with that in mind, uh, why don't we go ahead and, and I'll just kind of steer us into, into our slides. And, and Jennifer, if there's anything I missed, feel free to jump in and correct me or steer me. Okay, we're good. All right, so let's, let's keep rolling. Uh, so first, as, as I like to do whenever we do these, first, a, a, just a huge thank you to, to Jennifer Brown and to Shaylin for coordinating and, and managing the, the webinar process. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk some today about our, our research and our work we're doing at Duke. Um, we've had a number of anonymous families who have been generous to support our work. We have one in particular anonymous family who has provided significant funding to help us launch and, uh, and become a center. And so we're, we always want to express our gratitude to all of the families and in particular to, to the family who's helped us uh, be where we are today. Uh, the Center for Misophonia and Emotion Regulation is a, is a large team and I want to thank my team in advance uh, for all of the work they're doing. And in particular, I uh, want to thank Lisa and, and Claire who are here with us. We have at this point recruited and uh, begun collecting data on uh, a thousand people in over, uh, we're on month 14 of, of existing as the Duke Center for Misophonia and Emotion Regulation. And we've had a thousand people reach out to us. And I would like to say that this research community of people with misophonia, as well as their parents and loved ones, by a landslide are the most enthusiastic community of people to support research uh, that I've ever heard about or experienced directly. Uh, and I've been, been doing research at Duke for 20 years, uh, and it's just been extraordinary to have the, the type of enthusiastic response we, we get. So thank you to the research participants. Some of you may be with us here uh, in this webinar. Thank you to the patients and loved ones that we treat and who have also reached out to me separate and to all of us coordinating this separate to share your stories and to, to give us ideas about your experience. Your, your experience shared with us really does give us hypotheses and ideas about what to study scientifically. And it also helps us think through what we might need to do clinically. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanna thank advocates, all of you who are supporting research, education and treatment of misophonia. The, these webinars, one of the things about these webinars is that on the webinar we have uh, we'll have doctors and psychologists, we'll have social workers, we'll have audiologists and occupational therapists, music therapists. We have a really rich multidisciplinary group of people here right now, likely with us, as well as many patients, many people, many clients, many people, right, with misophonia uh, and related kinds of, of difficulties. And we always have parents on these calls and, and loved ones. So this is a very sort of diverse group here. And um, uh, we also often have, have people who are interested in um, advocating or funding uh, the work that is done on misophonia. So I just wanna thank everyone and welcome everyone who's, who's here. All right, so we're gonna give you a couple of quick updates from our work to kick us off. Then we're gonna talk about how to understand cognitive behavioral therapy as it applies to misophonia. I'm gonna really share with you our most recent work that we're doing clinically and talk a bit about uh, what that looks like. And then we'll do our Q&A. All right, so for folks who, who don't know us, who are new to, to the Duke-Seamer 
our center. Uh, we have a website, misophonia.duke.edu. Uh, you can see it at the bottom of the screen. And this picture is a little bit dated now. Uh, we've got some different folks. Um, we need to probably update our picture, but this is us about a year ago. Um, and uh, we have all sorts of information, including how to, how to participate in our studies or how to, uh, how to help fund the research we're doing. Uh, as well as information about misophonia that really often is the type of FAQ information that people on these webinars uh, will like to ask. So take a look and, and hopefully it's helpful. Since our last webinar with, with you all, we've done a number of things from our center. Uh, you can take a look and, and, and read this. Uh, I won't read every single thing, but you can see we've been busy. We've been busy uh, presenting at national conferences that are virtual. We've been uh, writing and publishing papers. And um, at the bottom of the screen, you can see we, we are close now to submitting for publication our uh, long-awaited Duke Misophonia Questionnaire, which is a, a new self-report measure of misophonia, symptoms and impairment, and different ways of coping. So this will be when it's published a, um, a new measure that comprehensively can be used to characterize misophonia in research as well as in, in a clinical setting. Oh, I should actually just say one thing about this is I think today, Claire and Jen, isn't it today that this paper was officially published? Literally today, this, this uh, uh, recently published papers is as recent as literally this morning, we got the email, it was just published today. Uh, so yeah. we're excited about that. Uh, we're doing a lot of different research and, and I, I don't have the time uh, here to kind of get into the depths of, of all of these studies, but um, Here's a list of what we're doing at Duke. We were propped up by philanthropic funds uh, about um, just a little over uh, a year and change ago, two, we're in, I guess now two years ago. And um, at this point, we've stretched our resources to the point where we really can't do any, any new research studies because we're so tapped out with, with our bandwidth of all of the research that we are doing, which is a really, really good thing. We're really busy and these are the things we're doing. Um, I told you about making the new measure. We're also developing a and validating a new uh, interview that can be used clinically or scientifically. Uh, we're doing our phenotyping study, which is designed to characterize the features and correlates uh, of misophonia. Uh, we're validating standardized sounds to use uh, in research on misophonia and doing a brain imaging and brain modulation study. Uh, Dr. Nekshu, who's a part of our group, has funding from the Misophonia Research Fund to do this work. Uh, we're doing a study to understand exactly what happens over time throughout the days and weeks of people who, who suffer with misophonia. So not just looking at one point in time and asking questions about lifetime, but really looking over time in a more kind of longitudinal way uh, to see what does that variability look like in order to help figure out where we can create interventions that really target those processes that emerge when we see what those patterns look like. Uh, and number seven, you can see we're developing some cognitive behavioral therapies. Uh, we did do a, a, a survey a few months back on uh, COVID-19 uh, on misophonia and emotion regulation and are uh, looking to, to do some publishing of, of that data set. Uh, and then you'll hear Dr. Robbins talk today at the end uh, of, our, of our presentation about a type of cognitive behavioral therapy uh, called the UNIFI protocol, uh, or the, the UP, as she'll call it. And uh, the UP is a new type of CBT that Dr. Robbins is an expert in. And we are studying in our center through a grant that Dr. Robbins received from the Misophonia Research Fund. Uh, so you can see here lots of different work we're doing and we are very excited about it all. We look ahead to, the, to this year. You can see we're doing, we're doing a lot of, of research, so we're going to be collecting a ton of data. Uh, and we're going to be, as I said, publishing, hopefully, as soon as possible, our, our Duke Misophonia questionnaire. By the way, if you're curious about it, it is posted. The, the PDF of it is posted for, for your feedback and for preliminary use with our permission on our website. So feel free to go take a look at it if, if you're curious. I got a happy mouse that likes to go back apparently. Sorry about that. 
Um, we also are looking to, as always, develop new collaborations. That takes funding to, to do at this point because we're, we're stretched with how much work we're doing, but we are uh, actively partnering and, and looking to develop new partnerships. Um, we are also, as I said, going to look to develop new models of support and advocacy for misophonia. This is an area that we think strategically needs a lot more work. And we're going to be partnering with Jen and Shaylin and others to, to really see what we can do to be, uh, to be helpful in this area. One interesting thing that we can look for uh, in the misophonia community in the year, in this year ahead is uh, that there, there will be a new consensus definition of misophonia that is published through support from the Reem Foundation, the Misophonia Research Fund, and the Milken Institute. Uh, myself and a number of other experts were part of a consensus committee that uh, has, we're near finalizing the, the final definition of what in fact misophonia can be defined as, uh, because it turns out that is actually a, slip, a more slippery fish to get your hands around than one might think. Uh, it, it's, it's really been challenging to define it. As you know, it's a new thing in the world to define, and uh, a lot of people have you know, different opinions about what they think it is and isn't. And so a group of us have now uh, through a very careful, rigorous process, uh, nearly gotten to the point where we have final consensus. And what's great is we'll then publish this and the scientific and clinical and lay community will have it and can then um, critique it, can uh, do scientific studies to support it or refute it, uh, and can really hopefully have something to use for advocacy and support because we'll have something that is a, de a definition of what in fact this is. Uh, and then last, we are always looking at, for new philanthropic funding. So we were actively pursuing that and are grateful to our partners and always are looking for additional funding to do all the things we want to do because we are ambitious. We want to do a lot. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now and, and transition here to talking about CBT. First thing to mention here is in parentheses, you see on this slide, in a multidisciplinary manner. So I want to emphasize that when we talk about doing cognitive behavioral therapies for misophonia, we're talking about this as one part, ideally, of a multidisciplinary care plan where you have other providers in a coordinated fashion providing care for the individual. So you might have an audiologist or an occupational therapist or both working with the psychologist and maybe with a psychiatrist, maybe with a neurologist, maybe with a pediatrician or a primary care doc. The idea is that misophonia is not something that necessarily any one provider has all of the tools to treat. And so we want to have a more multidisciplinary approach. Now, saying that, what we're gonna talk about now is within that multidisciplinary approach, what the psychologist or the social worker, or really the behavioral health provider can do. I'm a clinical psychologist. Uh, I'm, I'm somebody who does cognitive behavioral therapies. It's something that we do in our clinic and in our center. So we're gonna talk about that in a more narrow and, and deep way now. One of the really interesting things for, for, um, for me as a, as a CDT person is that most of the time when you read about CBT, or when you hear about it, it is written or talked about as though it is a single clear thing. But I'm here to tell you that cognitive behavioral therapy as a thing, a simple thing, does not exist. There is no such singular thing as CBT. Instead, CBT is really a type of, a type of therapy, a sort of a class or a category of therapy that uses evidence-based principles of change translated from science, from, from human science, from animal science, takes these kind of translations that we learn about change in science and then kind of morphs them into techniques that can be then used to help people. So what does that mean? It means people in CBTs might learn ways to change behavior, change thinking, change attention, emotion, physiological arousal, or other areas of functioning. So it's not the case that 
just because the, the, the letters are C and B, that somehow we only focus on thinking or behavior. It's kind of bigger than that. It, it, in fairness, when CBT was born, and I'll spare you the long lecture because we don't have the time and it might bore you, but when it was born, it really was born in a way that it was much more narrowly cognitive change focused and behavior change focused. But that was a long time ago. That was decades ago. That's not today. So today what CBT is, is a family of treatments. The best way you can think about it is that there is no such thing as CBT. There is only CBTs, plural. CBT is plural, which is why I bolded it at the bottom of this slide. Think of it like a class of medications. There is no such thing as the antidepressants. There's antidepressants, many of them, and there's lots of different types with lots of different examples. So CBT is like a class of behavioral therapies that are evidence-based and have a many different particular interventions woven into them. All right, so which CBT should you do if you have misophonia? Well, there is no evidence-based cognitive behavioral therapy that has been subjected to enough scientific testing to say that it works specifically in, for misophonia. That hasn't been done. Now, I'm going to talk in the next couple slides about what has been done, but it's really important to highlight that there is no evidence-based treatment that's been through the usual routine of many years, if not decades, of scientific research across many labs and many investigators using many methods. That hasn't been done. We haven't had enough time yet. The first study scientifically of misophonia began to emerge only in 2013, not very long ago. So we're new in the scientific study of misophonia. So what do we do? What do we, how do we do CBT for misophonia if there is no treatment specifically for misophonia? Well, there's a couple of things to recommend. And this is kind of a reflection of how we, how we work at Duke with our, with our patients and what you, know, what you can think about. So the first, the first point here, right, my dog just walked in and my dog just got taken out. This is life in a pandemic. This is me, me being me. Uh, okay, so the first thing is that many of the cognitive behavioral therapies are evidence-based, meaning backed in science, for specific psychiatric disorders. A misophonia is not a psychiatric disorder. It's not been categorized as such. But many people with misophonia will have psychiatric disorders that co-occur with misophonia. There is no specific single psychiatric disorder that co-occurs with misophonia. There isn't, there is no one. There are many different potential psychiatric disorders that our scientific research has told us might co-occur in the presence of misophonia. So there isn't just one treatment to do for that one thing that really always comes with misophonia. That's not how it is. In other words, we can't just assume misophonia is simply gonna happen when people have disorder X or disorder Y. You know, not too long ago, for example, only about four or five years ago, we used to hear people say, well, gosh, isn't misophonia just like OCD? It's just OCD, so we should do the CBT for OCD, which is exposure therapy. But it turns out now, even in that past couple of years, short amount of time, we've learned that misophonia most definitely is not the same thing as OCD. There isn't a single shred of scientific evidence that suggests otherwise. It's different than OCD. There are some features that might connect, but it is most definitely not OCD. And in fact, the features that connect with OCD and misophonia are really truly the features that are not, they're not OCD features so much as they are features you might see across a variety of different psychiatric problems. Okay, so that's, I'll, not go down that rabbit hole, but just to say that point. Um, so what's the teaching point here? The teaching point is that when you're thinking about which CBT to do, if the patient, if the person, and if you are the patient or the loved one, 
if the person or if you have a particular psychiatric problem for which there is an evidence-based approach that works, we would recommend doing that evidence-based treatment for that particular problem. In other words, people will come to us sometimes to Duke and they may meet criteria for something like borderline personality disorder. But dialectical behavior therapy is a treatment that's the gold standard cognitive behavioral therapy for BPD, for borderline personality disorder. So that would be the thing we would recommend doing. Do that. Treat that. Do that in a way that is consistent with what misophonia is. So it be, it's really a case conceptualization, personalized driven way, doing it in a way that accounts for misophonia very, very carefully. Not, okay. just, not just doing DBT as it normally is, really thinking about how to make it work for that person. Zach, can I ask you to clarify? Sure. Are you saying that there is a high co-occurrence of misophonia with psychiatric disorders, not any specific one psychiatric disorder, but just a high co-occurrence of psychiatric disorders. And of course, it makes sense to treat the psychiatric disorder with whatever the evidence-based treatment is, but that the evidence-based treatment for whatever the psychiatric disorder does not necessarily treat misophonia, but certainly you are better off treating what you can treat. I am so, saying- is that, a, is that a correct statement? Yeah, yeah, I'm saying all of that um, and, uh, and saying that we would want the, the, the psychologist or social worker, whoever's doing the treatment, we would want them to do that treatment in a way that's very thoughtfully accounting for misophonia, not ignoring it. In other words, you don't treat the psychiatric disorder and then treat misophonia sequentially. It's not like that. It's treating the, it's treating the psychiatric disorder for which there is an evidence-based approach. Again, only if there is a psychiatric disorder. Right. Many, many, many patients, many people with misophonia don't have a psychiatric disorder. Many do. And in fact, scientifically speaking, we don't yet know what the precise, you know, we don't really know exactly what we should predict in terms of what types of disorders for misophonia and what's the percentage. What we know is there's a full spectrum of people with and without any, I have plenty of patients who don't have a single psychiatric problem who come to my clinic and we're working on misophonia and there's no psych issue. And, and then plenty that do have and plenty in between. And so just a, one more quick question that I think might be on people's minds. For the people who do have a psychiatric disorder, might it be that misophonia is a risk factor for developing a psych disorder? Absolutely. If, it's a great question, Jen. If, if you, it could be that way. It could be that misophonia is a, is a risk factor for future, uh, for future various types of problems. And, and we, we have no, there's no science that suggests exactly what the trajectory could be predicted to be, but I typically tell people, typically it's parents, is that um, it could and very likely is reasonably a risk factor. And so let's see what we can do to help prevent, prevent the onset of, of problems later. Thank you. The teaching point for this slide is, is really just, I think fairly simple. It's if there is another problem for which there is a solution, do that solution, do it in a smart way that counts for misophonia. That's really all this slide is, is saying. In, in the world of CBTs, there are a number of studies in, in recent years that have begun to take a case study uh, approach to look at how to use cognitive and behavioral interventions to help people with misophonia. And here's some examples. This is not a full list. This is just some examples of some of the ones. And um, they all tell a similar story, which is that uh, for a very small sample size of one or two or 10 or 18, you know, small sample, they're learning that they can in fact feasibly use a cognitive behavioral approach and that it does appear for those particular people to maybe be beneficial. Now, case studies are great to begin learning about something, but case studies in no way, shape or form are evidence that is comprehensive or conclusive. So these case studies are sort of like things that people do when they're beginning to learn about something and trying to raise awareness about it to the greater community. So they're fabulous for that, but don't take away any conclusions 
from, from these. We, in other words, we can't say CBT works because of these studies. Cannot be said. All we can say is some people have begun trying to use some CBTs and there may be some promise. It's worth continuing to explore. The largest of the previous CBT studies was done by uh, the Amsterdam group, uh, Schroeder et al. And they published this paper several years ago. This, as you can see, was a eight week group cognitive behavioral therapy. And what they found in this type of study where you just look at, it's called an open trial, where you just look at beginning and end of treatment in one group, and you don't have any type of control condition or any comparison group. Uh, what they found in this open trial is that uh, a large number of their patients had a significant reduction in misophonia symptoms following their eight-week group CBT treatment. Again, you can't conclude anything from this study other than this looks like a very promising approach. But without any control group to compare it to, there really isn't a way to say that this particular treatment is the right or best treatment. So what do they do in this group? People ask me this a lot. I imagine, Jen, they ask you this as well. Um, it's difficult when you read the, the article, it's difficult to, to sort of extract the details. And some of it's very technical and not as lay friendly because it's a scientific paper. So I'll try to quickly distill down what they do. There's a couple of main components in this, in this group therapy. The first is psychoeducation. This is helping people learn about their body and learn about their mind and their brain and how it all works as it relates to, to misophonia and what we think might be going on inside of the body and in the brain and, and behavior uh, with people with misophonia. So psychoeducation, uh, necessary, helpful, probably insufficient as a treatment for misophonia, but absolutely necessary to be one important piece. The second piece is support and validation, which also is probably necessary, but not sufficient to, as, a, as a treatment. So there's a lot of group support and therapist support, a lot of validation and compassion. And if you have misophonia or you're a family member or you're in this, this sort of community, one of the things you know very, very well is that you feel invalidated and you get invalidated often because a lot of people don't know about this, don't understand it, or frankly, just downright invalidated. So providing validation and support, very critical piece of treatment. Third piece is attentional training. So in this treatment, they devote some time to training people, not talking, but training them, kind of like think physical therapy as an analog. When you go to physical therapy, you, you learn how to do the stretch. Right? So you don't talk about the stretch, they show you the stretch and you do the stretch and then they send you on your way and you're supposed to do it and maybe you do it, maybe you don't. But that's the idea, right? As you, you practice that stretch. So the same idea here for attentional training, they have people practice focusing their attention in the face of distractors. So they're learning directly how to improve their attention when distracted. <clears throat> Fourth component, Cognitive reappraisal, which is a standard way of, uh, in CBTs of helping people identify and then challenge automatic thoughts that are not truly based in facts, for which there might be a more flexible, adaptive, you know, healthy way of making sense of yourself or of your future or of, of others. So they do a little bit of this as well. Uh, a fifth component is they do um, what they call sensorimotor therapy, which um, is kind of like a relaxation training exercise where they help people learn to, to, to relax their body in muscle groups. So they're controlling their physiological arousal as another part of what they're learning to do. This is a very old um, uh, and very helpful tool in the toolbox of CBT therapists. The last thing they do is, is a counter conditioning approach where they ask people to self produce brief videos on their phone and they give them the tools to do this. And these, these uh, videos, what they do is they record their own trigger sounds and then they play their trigger sounds in this video with 
incongruent visual cues, incongruent. So um, sometimes those are, in, in one video, those are, are pleasant cues. And in other video they make, it's a neutral type of cue. Example, to make it concrete, imagine on your computer screen or your phone right now, imagine there's schematic footsteps stepping. And what you see is a black screen, but there's footsteps, the shape of a footstep stepping. And each time the footstep steps, you hear the sound, and I won't make it because I don't want to trigger anyone, but it's the sound of a sniffle. And if you, if you imagine the sound of a sniffle, it actually, if you saw that sniffle, if you heard the sniffle sound while you saw the foot stepping, your brain doesn't register it as a sniffle because the foot stepping makes your brain think and perceive that the sound you're hearing is the sound of leaves or rocks or gravel or snow, something that sounds like sniffles when you take a step back and think about it, but in the visual context of foot stepping, your brain does not perceive sniffle. Can I interrupt for one second? I just have to say that I have, some of you may know this, that I have misophonia and I saw this actually in, in I'm sorry, what was his lab, um, the name of the? The Amsterdam Medical Center. Lab. Well, th this is the AMC, but this is Amsterdam. Somebody, the other doctor who was doing this in his lab? Davidenko. Dr. Davidenko. David and I have to tell you all that it was shocking. I, I My mouth was, literally hanging open. I couldn't believe it. I was hearing one of my trigger sounds and watching something that was not congruent. And I didn't even know I was hearing one of my trigger sounds. So there's right. truly something to this. So it's kind of exciting to know that from a person who actually has misophonia, that there's really something here. Thank you, Jen. So that's what they're doing. That's, that is not something that we've tested at Duke or that's been tested in the States yet. It's a group therapy. Um, here, I'll quickly summarize what we're doing at, at Duke. We're looking at two different types of CBTs and we're testing them both at this point. The first one we'll call process-based CBT. The second is the unified protocol. Both of these treatments target processes that relate to regulation of emotion and emotional processes. So how to like, not be triggered as much using what we call stimulus control strategies, how to control your attention and deploy your attention strategically, cognitive therapy interventions like the ones we talked about before, changing problematic ways of thinking that aren't fully grounded in fact, uh, learning how to change in behaviors to maybe be, uh, to in inhibit or to express more behaviors, to approach or to avoid more or less in different contexts, and as, as well, physiological strategies. So both of these treatments do all of that. Um, and, um, and we think this is important because emotion regulation plays, we think, a role in, in misophonia, and we've started to publish some work on this. Okay, what is process-based CBT? So this is a trans-diagnostic meaning. It's not for one disorder. It's not for one it's not, it's not like that. It's a trans-diagnostic approach to help a wide variety of people, no matter the label that they have. So this is a way of looking beyond labels, getting out of that medical model, and really saying, what are the principles of change that work across humans to change basic processes? So it's grounded in science and it pulls out processes that can be flexibly applied to each person in a way that works for them. So we focus on understanding the patient and their environment. And I say patient only because I work in the hospital setting, client, patient, person, you know, insert your own word. It's just what we're used to saying at, at, at Duke. So we're going to use evidence-based principles of change and then share decision-making. This means that I don't think I have the answers for this. I'm going to give you tools show you the toolbox and together we're gonna to decide what you think makes the most sense and what you're most willing to do. So it's a shared decision-making model where what we do first, second, and third is gonna be up to you as, as patient. I'm gonna give you the, the tools and you're gonna sort of decide what you wanna start with. That's what that means. First session, there's orientation, learning about the patient, learning about treatment, learning about misophonia, and doing what we do in really any psychotherapy, which is to build what we call the therapeutic alliance, which is essentially a way of saying, let's be sure that we're working towards the same goals together. 
on the same timeline using the same method. We have to be two trains leaving the same station at the same time, going the same direction, the same speed to the same destination. Right? We have to be together in sync to make this treatment work. And that, that's something any therapy will do. In session two, we do what's called a functional analysis. It was just a sort of a fancy term for a basic tool, kind of the screwdriver of, of behavioral therapies that you can use with, with any, any person uh, to help them understand what causes and maintains reactions to triggers and precisely where to intervene and how to intervene. So for you clinicians who are here, you probably know what this is. This is a, this is a many decades old standard part of the, the CBT therapist toolbox. But it's really helpful because it allows us to figure out together what predicts triggering and what are the outcomes of that. And as you'll see in a minute, that gives us a scaffold to figure out where to intervene. So when we build this scaffold, which I'll show you this sort of grid, I'll show you a grid actually, we build this together from the functional analysis and we choose the first treatment target together. Again, shared decision-making. And then session three is typically when we begin learning new ways to prevent and cope with, with triggers. And as we move forward then, there's this kind of routine of identifying that target we wanna change, learning the new cognitive or behavioral skills that address a particular problem they want to solve, practicing that skill together. And then that's something then that gets assigned for home practice. And of course, we're gonna evaluate change using some sort of way of measuring that. If you're a visual learner, this is probably the most, a better way to think about it. Visually, we use this grid. So you've got your columns before, during, and after being triggered. And then on the rows, you've got different areas of functioning. So as we do the functional analysis, we're asking a lot of questions to understand right before, right during, and right after being triggered typically, in general. And then we're asking questions about each of these areas of functioning. What's happening with your attention, with your behavior, physiologically in your body, interpersonally with how you're relating to people, and then cognitively with how you're thinking about yourself or, your, or others or your future. So this grid is our real tool we use a lot because we fill this out with the patient and it allows us together very collaboratively to work together to figure out where are the points in time, typically before you're triggered, during and after, where you're having the most distress, the most impairment, and also which of these cells on this do you want to target first? And which ones do you not want us to target? And the reality is when we fill this out, it's different for every person. It's always different. It's always different. And that's why we use this because it allows us flexibility to figure out together, what are we gonna do? Now you might say, so, so we fill, fill it out, then what? Well, what happens is that for each one of these rectangles, there are evidence-based cognitive behavioral therapy interventions that work for people, not necessarily only for misophonia. Again, let go of the label. Let's look at one example and I'll show you. So when I enter a new space, I'm hyper alert for trigger sounds. And that's the thing the person wants to work on. That's going to be hypervigilance. And we would use evidence-based interventions for hypervigilance. For some people with misophonia, that's the most distressing part of it all. And they want help with that. For others, they might say, I feel physically overwhelmed while the sound is there and it can't go away. And so now that's a physiological target during being triggered. And that's, we're gonna, we're gonna use cognitive and behavioral therapy interventions to target that at that point in time. For others, it might be after it's over, I just think about the person, how disgusted I am with them. They ruin my day. Maybe they start blaming or judging or getting mad at themselves or other people. So you can see on this grid, now we're in the after column after being triggered, the stimulus is over, the trigger's gone, now the problems are ensuing. That's cognitive, that's after, we have interventions for that. Let's do them, okay? Well, what would they be? Well, if it was the hypervigilance, it might be that we help them reduce or be less impaired by hypervigilance. 
that begins to be our target for change. If it's physiologically, we reduce or tolerate intense autonomic arousal. And if it's cognitive after, we would change the content of how the person is thinking or the context of how that person thinks. Those are two different sets of cognitive therapy interventions. One that's change-based, one that's mindfulness and acceptance-based. Again, we'd let the patient decide which of these they wanna do. So as an example, when I enter the new space, I'm hyper alert for the trigger. What specific CBT skills could be done? Well, there are just a couple of examples. Mindfulness-based work can be used. It has to be carefully crafted to that person, and this person would have to choose to want to do this. If they don't want to do it, we wouldn't do it, right? So mindfulness-based work, helping the person learn to focus their awareness and strengthen their attentional networks in their brain by learning how to not be as distracted by distractors, to be less judgmental of self and others. We might use intentional distraction methods as a different skill to help people direct their attention to a different activity temporarily to achieve goals and context. So we might help them essentially learn how to use distraction or use mindfulness. We teach it, we practice it, we rehearse it, we role play it, we model it, we'd assign it for home, home practice. The next week we'd come back and we'd look at how it went and we'd rinse and repeat as needed. If it was the physiological problem, well, we might use physiological strategies. Those are also in the toolbox for CBT, helping the person regulate their nervous system using exercise, running, activity, breathing, relaxation, any number. There are countless examples of interventions that work. Okay, what about cognition? As I said, we'd help people change their attributions or their thoughts, sorry about that. Uh, whether it's about self or whether it's about other, right? changing how they think. An example, helping people learn that some sounds are necessary biological sounds that people make, not because they're trying to do bad things, but because they are necessary sounds that people make biologically. Someone's sick, someone you know, has a hard time breathing, they're gonna be breathing heavier or louder and helping people kind of think this through. Concrete doesn't apply to everybody, just giving you uh, an example. Okay, so process-based CBT, flexible, tailored, evidence-based. The person chooses which cells on that grid to use first, and the goals are to improve functioning and decrease suffering. The CBT strategies are used. They have strong evidence for working across therapies for lots of different problems, and so we feel very confident using these rather than having to wait decades until somebody validates across multiple labs and multiple places, a new treatment for misophonia. This is something to do in the interim while the science is being done to develop this specific new treatment. And importantly, this is not exposure therapy, but it does include a lot of strategies to help people directly learn. All right, I realize that we've got only 12 minutes left and we started a few minutes late and got, got out of the gates a little slowly. So um, I'm gonna ask you, Claire, to be as brief as you can in these last couple of slides and then we'll use time for Q&A. Absolutely. I am happy to do that. And if anyone is finding they have questions about the unified protocol, please feel free to let me know in the chat. I'm always happy to share more information or papers. So the unified protocol or the UP, as I'm going to call it, is a transdiagnostic emotion focused treatment. It is an evidence based treatment for emotional disorders such as anxiety, depression, trauma related disorders and OCD. However, as Zach was talking about earlier, it really lets go of the diagnostic label associated with these different conditions and focuses on what we think of as the common core underlying processes that are shared across diagnostic categories. And we think that these processes might be relevant to misophonia as well. And so my study that I've started that was mentioned earlier is to examine the acceptability and feasibility of this treatment for adults with misophonia, as well as to start to look at its efficacy. Can you go to the next slide, Zach? Thank you. So I'll let you pop those up. What are the common core underlying processes, you might ask? They are, as you see here, 
what we often find are that folks uh, experience an intense emotion. And I'm going to use a misophonia example for today, but know that this is something, a process that we think applies across a lot of different problems with emotional functioning. So a lot of folks with misophonia will tell me that they experience really intense emotions in response to sounds like anger, disgust, or anxiety. And oftentimes these emotions are difficult to experience. They're uncomfortable and, and people don't like them. This is what I call the, the yuck, get it away from me, right? It's just a really aversive, uncomfortable experience. And so from that, it makes a lot of sense that they try to do what it takes to make that emotion go away. And, and sometimes these are things that are effective. And, and sometimes these are things that are effective in the short term, but backfire in the long term. For example, if you yell at someone to be quiet, they might be quiet in the moment, but in the long term, that can be really damaging to the relationship. And so what we do in this treatment is use CBT skills to help patients go from this top row down to this bottom row where they see the emotion as more tolerable and acceptable. They see the experience as something they can manage so that they don't rely on strategies that are ultimately ineffective. Next slide, please. So I won't go through all of these, and, and Zach already spoke really nicely to many of them. The unified protocol works through the skills you see listed here in this order for now. And all of these skills are relevant to helping folks with misophonia manage the strong emotions that might come up as part of that experience. So, you know, we talked about mindfulness earlier. It's a great example. Lots of people tell us that when they hear misophonic sounds, it sucks up all of their attention and they can't focus on anything else. So we use mindfulness skills to help folks ground themselves in the present moment and orient their attention to what they want to focus on and what they need to focus on. And we similarly work through all of these skills you see listed here as relevant to misophonia and any other problems they might be experiencing such as depression or anxiety. Now you might notice that the last two items are exposure. And Zach, you can go to the next slide. And so I just want to say a little bit more about exposure because as, as it stands, we, we understand and we've heard from the community that traditional habituation-based exposure is really ineffective and, and largely unacceptable. And we, we totally understand that. And so we just want to acknowledge that there are lots of different types of exposure. Exposure is really about learning and there are lots of ways to learn. And so traditional habituation-based exposure is one type. It's not the type we use in the UP. And so in, in Traditional exposure, the goal is to habituate to something that's distressing across sessions. So if we use an example of throat clearing, if we were doing habituation-based exposure, you, the patient would listen to throat clearing until they were no longer distressed by that sound, and then they would move on to another sound. And again, we, we have heard repeatedly in our work that this is not an effective type of exposure. However, another type of exposure is what's called inhibitory learning. And this is based on, or sorry, the goal here is to help patients learn how to manage in different contexts. So this might involve having a patient um, listen to the throat clearing noises while doing something else so they can learn how to use the skills they've been practicing in a distressing situation. There's also systematic desensitization, which involves practicing relaxation techniques while being exposed to unpleasant sounds, and counter conditioning, which Zach mentioned earlier, is pairing the sound with something that's incongruent, like footsteps with sniffing. It's a very brief explanation, and we can skip this slide in the interest of Q&A. Um, happy to talk more about it if people have questions. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for, for asking questions. I'm just trying to catch up with them. Um, Jen, is there anything you wanted to highlight from the chat box? Any questions? Um, yes. Well, I, I also just wanted to say that one of the things about process-based cognitive therapy is that it seems to include physiological-based therapy, but by the name itself, cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, one doesn't automatically think of it that way. So that may be confusing to people. And I thought that was important 
to point out. Um, so yes, uh, so let's just get to some questions. Um, my 15 year old son has Kawasaki disease when he was two and a half year old, we fear, and we fear that this has led to difficulties with both OCD and misophonia. Have you investigated this connection? I can tell you now probably the answer to that is no. Well, we, uh, no one's done any research on Kawasaki disease, specifically in misophonia. Um, as I said, the research is way too early for, for those kind of very specific questions. And there frankly isn't funding uh, to provide people jobs to, to do that type of research at that level of specificity. Mm -hmm. What I also could say though, is that um, we have in our work in our, what we called our phenotyping study, we ask, we, we do a, a full medical history. And if anybody on this is, in this webinar has been one of our research participants, um, you know it's a long medical history questionnaire. We get a lot of comments on that. We ask a lot of questions and we are trying to correlate any medical history problems, anything with the presence of misophonia and other problems. And at this point, I will say we don't have any correlation with Kawasaki disease uh, and misophonia symptoms. Um, so I can't, I can't speak to that. It doesn't mean there isn't a correlation. It just means we have not seen it in our, in our study. We have about 170 or so people at this point that we've done interviews with and collected data with. So it's not a tiny sample, but um, there's no connection that we can see at this point. Again, doesn't mean there isn't some connection in some way. We just aren't seeing it. Another question, uh, with a consensus definition, should we anticipate misophonia appearing in, a di in the in diagnostic manuals such as the DSM, et cetera? Well, that's a really good question, uh, Chris. That's an excellent question. Um, the next DSM change is slated to be in 2026, I believe. So it is theoretically possible that uh, in five years, at the next time it's changed, that um, uh, conditions such as misophonia, should they have enough scientific uh, research that's been funded uh, and demonstrating enough clarity, it's possible that something like misophonia, again, with enough funding and enough research comes enough results to then justify, uh, scientifically speaking, justify presence in the DSM. So it is theoretically possible the short answer though, Chris, is the consensus definition will not do it. What's needed is funding for research. A lot evidence. of research. A lot of it. Uh, it it's, it's, you, you can't just say something is and expect it will be somehow now in the DSM. There's a much higher bar to be included in the DSM. But the consensus definition should help, it should help build that case for additional people to fund to do the research. Maybe it's good to explain exactly what a consensus definition is. Sure, sure. So this group got together and went through a very rigorous method of uh, looking at how every uh, every um, uh, every paper that ever been published on misophonia defined it, and then we systematically went through a process of deciding what we agree on uh, is or is not relevant to include in a sort of final streamlined definition. And so we end up having kind of you know, what, what will emerge as, um, you know, several paragraphs worth of, of language defining, uh, defining misophonia. And I, I can't say more details about it because it's something that at this point is not completed uh, and we're bound to confidentiality until our process is done. And it could change over time. It could change over time. This will be a consensus statement. And what it will do is it'll allow us to then say, okay, we have a starting point, a starting point to work with scientifically and clinically. And then only through funding and through science will we really be able to say if something that's in the consensus uh, definition truly fits, science will be the answer to that. Another question is working with an audiologist and pairing music slash sound therapy proven effective? Oh, I wish I, wish I could say it, 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 that it was proven effective. I saw that Dr. Fox Thomas is, is here uh, and I wanna say hello to you, Lisa, nice to, nice to see you're here. Um, Dr. Fox Thomas is, is, a, is a misophonia expert and audiologist here in North Carolina. And I wish I could say 
that Dr. Fox Thomas had found the answer or that she was she knew the answer to that. The reality is there is no proven effective for misophonia. What is the case if, if, if Dr. Fox Thomas was presenting in this, she would tell you something like, uh, listening devices are often used as part of the multidisciplinary approach. They are tools in the toolbox to consider. And I, I refer many patients over to her to have those discussions and encourage everyone to work with audiologists closely to have those discussions. But there's no proven, there's no proven effective technique here. Uh, then someone wants to know um, one last question and thank you for your responses. We are participating in a Baylor study. Is there any cooperative effort between agencies? Um, we don't have any any collaboration with Baylor, but we are we are open. We are always um, we are always open for collaboration and and uh, be happy to speak with folks at Baylor about what they're doing. Let me see if I missed anything here. Let me take a quick look if I missed anything. Lisa, Lisa Lynn's been answering. Oh, I did miss something. What kind of CBT is recommended for 12 to 13 year olds? Well, that's a good question. I, I mean, that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a child psychologist. So I'm gonna ask you, Jen, as a child. Okay, so um, I think for 12 to 13 year olds, I mean, first of all, it def of course depends on the specific 12 to 13 year old because we're talking, you know, a 12 year old and a 13 year old, one can be a lot more developed than another. So it depends how developed and how mature that specific teenager or tween is. And it also depends on how that particular child takes to cognitive therapy. So again, it's always very individualized, but the idea of a process-based cognitive therapy where you are working on what the child or teen will respond best to is certainly gonna work the most. Now, I don't know that it's some 12 year olds will be able to fill out that grid with you and will tell you attention, right. you know, overwhelmed physiologically, some won't and you have to pull it out. So that's part of the difference. Um, when I work with somebody uh, around that age group, I can usually tell very quickly how much sort of self-reflection they have and how quickly they can tell me, here's what's going on. I always start with psychoeducation. Psychoeducation for a 12, 13 year old is absolutely really important so you give them the skills to be able to go through that kind of a grid with you. Um, and, you know, they need often to learn more self physiologic self regulation skills because they're not as developed as say a 23 year old, um, their brain is not as developed. So you're working a little bit more on physiologic self regulation and you kind of really have to meet them where they are. And you have to also take into consideration that they have issues, you know, what do their peers think? What are they going through in typical adolescent development? So I hope that was a good enough answer for that. Certainly in the interest of time being limited, that was a great answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's my, my take. It's, it's a great question. And I, yeah, it's a, it's, and then I guess okay. Lisa's asking, what are your thoughts about support groups for misophonia? Yeah. Um, Lisa, that's a that's a really good question. We've just really begun to think seriously about that now that our center is up and launched, and we have all of this research going on and all this data coming in. Now we're turning our attention this calendar year to that a bit more than we have before. Um, we'd love to take input from people. Uh, we're looking to partner uh, with people who would like to partner to help build this out. We'll be talking to Jennifer and her team on what their thoughts are and others in the field. Um, there really are no, there is no national support network of people to do, uh, to do this, uh, to do support uh, groups or to provide any type of organized infrastructure for support. Thank you, Lisa. You're, you're definitely interested. That sounds good. We'll count on you. Um, uh, the, the problem is we don't have a, a model yet. So we're kind of beginning to think about what would the model look like to do this? And 
I think about this at a national level across, uh, across the country and ideally at an international level globally. So we're trying to think through what would this look like and, and we've just really begun to scratch the surface. Uh, support is a question. Advocacy is another question and how to create the best kind of awareness and advocacy campaign building on top of what already exists. And Jennifer, Shailen, they've spent years building this terrific infrastructure for this. There's certainly much more that could be done. And so we've got to figure out how do we do the right support and the right advocacy, not confuse the two, uh, and really do the best with some sort of outcomes to measure how we're doing so we know what we're doing. Again, the fact of the matter, all this is that it costs money to do these things. Uh, and so we need to figure out how, how to, to really partner with the right folks to, to make this work. Great question. I wish, I, I wish there was a, you know, call 1-800 uh, something and you get the gold standard, but we're not there yet. All right, we're over time and I, uh, I apologize for going a few minutes over. Um, it's been a real pleasure as always to, to uh, help facilitate this. Thank you to Shay Lynn. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Lisa Lynn, and thank you, Claire.